This is the all-new 2023 Toyota Sequoia. And this one is the new TRD Pro Trim. We're gonna check out all the features and then take it for a drive. That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. Long an underdog in the large SUV segment, for 2023, Toyota's pulling no punches with this new Sequoia. Today, we are going to look at this loaded TRD Pro and see how it drives, how the features come together, and what are some of the problems, because, sorry, it's not perfect. Now let's dive in to all the details. Under the hood is the new iForce Max 3.5 liter V6 engine. It has twin turbos, direct injection, port injection, and a hybrid assist system. This is a stout setup that also yields good MPGs. You're looking at 437 horsepower and 583 pound-feet of torque. As of time of filming, we don't actually know economy yet, but you can expect it'll be better than the outgoing model. Now it is connected to a 10-speed automatic transmission, and unfortunately, it's a part-time four-wheel drive system. That means that it is rear-wheel drive when you don't engage the four-high or four-low system. For the Sequoia, we looked at our customers' usage, and they're really active users. They like to tow, they like to off-road, so they need more power, they want more power, and they also want better fuel economy than what they're getting out of the current gen uh, powertrain. So when we look at our different powertrain options that we have, the iForce Mac met all those requirements. So the better power, better efficiency, and because the electric motor's there to help add assist to the the turbocharged engine, we get a very linear acceleration to the driver's inputs. Fundamentals of the powertrain come from other powertrains that have been around here now for a little bit, and we've just added on to that. The 3.5 liter V6 turbo and the 10 speed are based out of the LS, so things like the block is the same, it has the same bore and stroke, the transmission uh, architecture is the same, but the gear ratios are different for the Tundra and the Sequoia. On the engine, we added cooling capacity and things to help uh, meet our truck requirements. So we have to talk about the wheel entire package. First off, I love these 18 inch alloys. They look great in black with the red center caps. Now the tires, it does say Wild Peak AT, AT3W on the side. These are the Falcon off-road tires, but they're not the same ones you can go out and buy. The first indication is that these are not peak rated for snow like the regular Wild Peaks. The second thing is I run Wild Peaks on several cars. I know what they look like. This tread is not nearly as deep, which means you're not going to have that same kind of scooping action in snow and mud. So keep that in mind. These are not like your regular Wild Peaks, uh, but they are better than an all season. The max towing capacity of Sequoia is 9,520 pounds, which is a big increase. And we have all the good towing goodies, technologies in the system, the same that we do in Tundra to be able to help. So first we have two different tow haul modes. Uh, we have tow haul and then tow plus. So those different modes are set up to control things like the powertrain, the power steering, the brakes for the trailer brake controller are adjusted based on those modes to make it easier. So the tow haul mode is set up for up to 5,000 pound trailer. Uh, and the tow plus mode is set up for up to max uh, towing capacity, up to the 9,520 pounds. Then we also have things like our cameras and our, our backup assist. So all of those technologies are able to help the customer to have an easier towing experience, not just on the road, you know, driving from point A to point B, but also at home trying to park the trailer, or trying to pull into a boat ramp or something like that. In the back, you can use a button or a foot wave to open it up. And we get three rows. Now the problem here with the three row setup is the fact that you can't take the third row out. It's permanently installed. And that means you don't get a large cargo capacity. Say you wanna take the family of four on a camping trip. I'd love to put all my stuff in here, but you lose a lot of space because of that third row. Now you can use this shelf system to create level surfaces, but it does not help with your total capacity. From the rear seat and understanding that you can't remove the rear seats, we really focused on how the customer can best utilize the rear seat room. So we used to have a slide on past generations on the second row. We've moved that to the third row. We heard from the customers that 
luggage space was a concern. They couldn't move the rear seats, they could put them down, but if you have somebody in the back seat, you can put them down and put suitcases back there. So we took that adjuster off that second row, put it on the third row, so now you can move the third row six inches. That allows you to put four large suitcases back there, still get 50 percentile males, my size people, back in that third row seat. Plus you've got the, the two captain's chairs or the bench seat up front. The other thing it allowed us to do is on the second row is we went from having a fold down and slide to get ingress, egress, or access to that third row seat, we went to a tumble seat. And that gives you a huge opening. So it's now really easy to get in and out of that third row seat, which we didn't have that luxury before. Behind the third row, you have a maximum of 22.3 cubic feet of cargo capacity. Fold that third row down and you get 49 cubic feet. With all rows folded flat, you're looking at 86.9 cubic feet overall. But I just cannot get over the fact that there's no way to remove that third row. I mean, short of a sawzall. It's really difficult to remove the seats from the fact that they are heavy. You know, it takes more than uh, one person to remove them. And then we have electrical connections. So you have a seatbelt reminder, which is now coming in as regulation. And we also have a power seat in there. So not only do they have to remove the seat, but they also have to be able to connect the, the electrical connections in there. Further, our battery pack is underneath it. And we're using the seat as supplemental uh, protection for that battery pack. So we have a battery pack in a metal case, we have a, the metal case in a metal case, and then we put the seat on top of it just to make sure, it's kind of like the icing on the cake, to make sure nothing can damage that battery pack in there. Okay, getting into the third row. Ah. Now clearly third rows are not really designed for adults, but I think it's kind of important just to see, because sometimes, you know, you got friends, you're going out, you need to pack everybody in, it can happen. So what do we got here? My knees are really high first off. My head, it rubs a little, but it's not too bad for a third row. Oh, look at that. We have a privacy screen in the third row, that's a trick. Like that. Two cup holders, I can put my seat. I don't know what's going on here, that, that switch isn't doing anything. Oh, it's supposed to go front back, but it's broken on this prototype car. So there is a way to adjust your seat back. Um, and this car is a prototype. So there are some things that aren't quite working, <laughs> but we know what they're supposed to do. Uh, and then there's also a USB-C socket on the right side. So not too bad. Oh, I even get a vent. That's nice. Now, how do I get out? I think there's a button right there. What, oh. Wait, that's my seat back? I'm a little confused. It's the same thing. Okay, the button's in two places. Okay, but now how do I get this out? Oh, I got a little pull thing there. Flip it up, and away we go. Finally in the second row, and um, <sighs> my, my head hits the roof. Now, keep in mind, I'm six foot one, legs torso proportionate. I do not have a long torso. Somebody who does, you won't be able to sit back here without absolutely reclining your seat as much as possible. This is how you'll have to sit. So the panoramic sunroof, of course, takes up some roof space because it's, it's large and the actuation of the motor and the, the glass coming back. You do have a little bit uh, less headroom in the second row seat. But we also have, as standard, a moonroof that's over the driver's seat, and that gives you uh, a little bit more headroom than the Pana roof does. I do, however, get a lot of good stuff here. I have a USB-A and USB-C socket. I also have a 120-volt AC, as well as my own aircon. I also get a privacy screen. Boop. Okay, now let's move to the front row, uh, where hopefully there's more headroom. Here we go, it's powered up. It is a hybrid, of course, so when you power it up, you get all the power of, you know, the screens all turn on and whatnot, but you don't always hear engine noise. It only makes a sound if it feels it needs uh, that extra electricity. So, obviously, this looks very much like the Tundra that it's based on. Um, we have very similar wheel, color design. We have the glorious 14-inch touchscreen display, which was developed out of their Plano headquarters. In fact, this entire vehicle was planned and designed, and also it'll be built here in Texas. Because we are in Texas, of course, we are just north of Dallas, and it is hot today. 
So uh, pardon me if I'm a little um, moist. So let's look at the seat positions. We got leather with this kind of technical camo design. It's cool. I have power adjustments. The passenger also gets power adjustments, which is a bonus. And I even get a lumbar control uh, if I want to adjust the lumbar on my back. Great. And further, they are both three stages of heat and ventilated. And yes, I have the ventilator on right now because, like I said, it's hot. I think the red interior is a bit much, but there are other interiors available, even in the TRD Pro here. Although this red is exclusive to the TRD Pro. Now, the steering wheel is really nice. It's covered in this leather with a little uh, center point indicator. On the left, I can control this digital gauge cluster. I've got, you know, the traditional Toyota layout of the little sub menu on the left. Uh, which shows me a number of features about the vehicle, including tire pressure, current economy. It says I'm averaging 16.6 MPGs right now. Unfortunately, at the time of filming, we don't know what the official EPA rating is yet, so that we'll wait and see. This is also where you can configure all of the advanced safety stuff. Now we have lane trace assist, pre-collision system, blind spot monitoring, parking, rear cross traffic alerts, and it'll even see street signs. This is using the Toyota Safety System 2.5. It's not the latest system, but it is a very good comprehensive system at least. Panorama sunroof lets in a lot of light. As I noted in the second row, not so great for headroom, but if you're more about the people up front, this is a nice addition, but you don't have to get it. Uh, the standard TRD Pro comes with a normal sunroof. Panorama is an option. Up here, we have Qi charging for mobile devices and this does support wireless carplay which is pretty cool yeah so let's dive into this system uh, we don't actually have to touch anything we can simply say hey toyota find me a starbucks results the first is starbucks at us 81 would you like to go to that one yes calculating route to starbucks See, it's a very modern system. You can use voice commands and, of course, to the, highlighted route. the display looks great. It's very clean, easy to use. Uh, my biggest complaint, and I voiced this when I did the Tundra review, is that there's no, like, home screen proper. It's just navigation. Um, and I really would like a compartmentalized view where I can see music, uh, maybe a car setting or two, like... Um, some of the off-road stuff, as well as an inset of maps. I think that would be nice in future editions. And this is over-the-air updatable, so they can always add that later. Um, hey, Toyota, tell me a joke. I love telling dad jokes. Sometimes he will laugh. I, I think that was supposed to be a joke. Uh, moving on, we have, obviously, entertainment. We can do FM, AM, plus Sirius XM. Uh, we can also use, of course, mobile devices uh, with wireless connectivity. And you can mate multiple devices. Let's go ahead and hook up, uh, add another device. This should be pretty straightforward. All I have to do is go to Bluetooth settings here, click on that, pair it, OK, allow. It says primary device, yes, OK, yes. Connected, OK, good, boom, there we go. Uh, now you can see that, you know, CarPlay is big and bold and, uh, yeah, really nice. In fact, let's see what OnX Off-Road looks like. I'm not sponsored by them, but I wouldn't mind it. Call me. Uh, take a look here. You can see just glorious mappage. Other things that you can do here. Uh, let's see, how do I get back to Toyota? I click on Toyota. Now we're back to the main system. I can go into the vehicle. We have trip alert and vehicle alert. Uh, but one of my favorite things about this vehicle is if I switch into uh, drive and then I go, oh, you can change camera views, right? So you have a nice surround view camera view as well as a front view. But if I go into four low, let's go into neutral switch that transfer case, I now go into a dedicated off-road mode that shows me my front wheel tracks. I can also change the view to see my wheels, and this will paint the picture underneath it so I can see where my wheels are in context to other things in the environment. Um, I can also dedicate to rear view or side and rear as necessary. Very cool setup. Looking forward to using that off-road. In fact, I'm going to turn it on to auto so it automatically engages in certain modes. Now, speaking of off-road, we do have even more features because now finally you can get the Sequoia with all the great off-road goodies that they've offered the TRD 
Pro and TRD off-road trims in the past. This set of features are actually available not just in the TRD Pro, but also in the TRD Off-Road, which is now a package available for SR5 and Limited. So you don't have to spend $76,900 for a TRD Pro. You can spend a little less because these start at about 58,000 and then you can add some packages on. You can probably get out the door for mid 60s or lower. Still a lot of money. I'm not just glossing that by. That is a lot of money, but if you want it, this is what you got. So talking about this off-road stuff, yes, we do have a part-time four-wheel drive system. And I think that's another miss in this vehicle. The previous generation Sequoia actually offered a center diff for full-time four-wheel drive. This one does not. You can buy this in no trim of any shape or form that has a full-time four-wheel drive. You only get it either in two-wheel drive or part-time four-wheel drive. That means that around town, you're gonna to be rolling in rear wheel drive. If you need to have some additional grip, you can go into four high, but you don't wanna drive that around town because it's gonna bind the transfer case, it's gonna bind the powertrain as you're turning because it's locking power 50-50 front back. You don't always want that when you're driving around town. So if you do encounter mixed conditions or you you know, want the security of four wheel drive all the time, this isn't the vehicle for you. You instead would have to go to like a Lexus LX600, which is based on the same platform and offers that feature. Now we do have drive modes, of course, but the ones I'm mostly interested in are the MTS, the Multi-Terrain Select. MTS improvement for the Sequoia is basically using not only just the braking systems to change you know, the slip control for the different modes, but now we also incorporate the powertrain into that. Both systems are working at the same time to be able to have a better experience. So for example, in mud, uh, in mud mode, uh, we're controlling the slip, um, but we're also, we changed the throttle to be very responsive. So, in, and when you're driving in mud, you want to clear the mud out of the treads as quick as you can. So if you get on the gas pedal a little bit, it spins the tire quicker and throws the mud out. And then if, it's, if your wheels really start slipping, the, the traction control and the brakes can start to, to control it a little bit. So that cooperation really helped. And same, similar for, for sand or snow, we, we did different things with the powertrain to make it so you don't slip so quickly. Um, you want to be nice and controlled, um, and, but still manage the different wheel slips. So lots of different uh, applications there. And the hybrid system as well, similar to tow mode, uh, we keep the engine on, which allows it for great response. So when you're crawling, doing rock crawl, for example, that initial instantaneous electric motor torque is really controllable for getting over that when your wheel is stuck up against a rock and you're trying to just kind of gently get over it. The iForce Max system really helps to uh, get you over that rock situation. Unlike the previous version of MTS, this is a new version where you can actually use the features in four high. You don't necessarily need to be in four low. That's a new thing. They work at higher speeds, which is awesome. And further, we also have crawl control, which is like an autopilot that combines MTS functionality in kind of a cruise control for off-road. Uh, that also works both uphill and downhill. So it's a hill descent system as well. And finally, on the Sequoia, you can get a rear locking differential. MTS and rear locker combined really allow the driver the confidence to be able to get out of any situation they want. Right? So a rear locker really helps when you have one, one wheel that's you know, really up in the air, you have really big articulation and you want just all the torque to just go through the system and not sit there and spin the wheel that's, that's up in the air. So um, if you have MTS and rear locker, you're pretty much invincible. You can go uh, any way you can in the Sequoia. So where, whereas MTS shifts power left and right by preventing wheels from spinning, a rear locker will actually connect the two wheels, kind of like the transfer case does front to back. It'll bind the two wheels in the back side to side so that they both turn at the same rate regardless of traction. That is very useful in very tricky conditions. Plus, there's a lot of towing features. Uh, as equipped, this one will tow 9,020 pounds. Uh, if you get a rear wheel drive, one of the other trims, you can get as high as 9,520 pounds of towing if you need that extra 500 bump. Okay, so we've looked at all the features. I think it's finally time to take it for a drive.
Good place to floor it. You know, for north of 400 horsepower, it sounds good, but it just doesn't have a lot of kick on the bottom end. I think they've really tuned this so that you don't get your maximum torque in the lowest gears from a zero because they really need to have a little bit of a roll in so you don't end up, you know, getting too crazy in this thing. But once we're rolling here, the sound is great. And yeah, some of that is fake noise, but it does have a specially tuned TRD exhaust. You get that with the TRD models. I'm sure Toyota will be happy to sell other trims the same exhaust system though. <laughs> oh, that does sound good. So in terms of wind noise, there's a little bit of buffeting on these big side mirrors. I can definitely hear that. If you move up to the capstone trim, which is the tippity top trim, that one does have acoustic glass both on the front and on the sides. This is of course the same exact powertrain that you would find in a new Tundra. Uh, so it's already, you know, been in production for a little bit now, not too long, but you know, they're hitting the street and you know, they're, they're pretty nice. You know, you get a lot of torque, they're more economical than the outgoing V8s. And then of course you also have the, the nicety of a hybrid powertrain electric. Interior cabin, don't love the big Toyota on the dashboard. I do love this huge 14 inch display. The view lines are pretty good, although the hood does take up uh, a whole sizable chunk of my visible area, especially those TRD Pro little vents, fake vents that they put on the hood. They definitely are very bold. Gauge cluster, I do like it. You don't really get to configure it at all. It, what you see is what you get, uh, but it's nicely configured with an easy to read uh, typeface. You have that big tack, and it also tells you what's going on in the other systems. And we do have different drive modes here, which will affect that. We have normal, eco, and sport. Sport obviously tightens up the uh, steering rack a little bit, uh, and it also creates peak output of the engine all the time normal day-to-day -day stuff. And then of course, Eco will use more of that electric assist to help improve economy. It'll also, uh, yeah, muddies up that throttle uh, pedal as well. Yeah, I gotta really dig in with the throttle there to get any action. Let's try a zero to 60, I'm lined up. Um, I'm in sport mode. I'm just gonna mosh the throttle and go. Three, two, one, go. And 60. In terms of safety, of course, this is fully loaded with Toyota Safety Sense 2.5 with the collision mitigation, blind spot warnings, rear cross traffic alerts, and it also has lane detection, lane centering, and adaptive cruise control. Let's try that out. I'm gonna go ahead and set my radar cruise control, set my speed. Make sure we have lane centering on, we do. It says it's active, and now it will keep me centered. Now this isn't a fully autonomous system, of course, it's just to ease the burden of very long journeys. So you don't have to be making micro adjustments all along the way. It's especially good, you know, if you're doing interstate travel, because all that little adjustment can get a little tedious. It's telling me to put my hands back on the wheel, no surprise there. But that seems to work. Let's see if we can try it on a little bit of a corner to see how much of a corner it can hang on to at speed. So we'll watch it turn. Yeah, it's doing a pretty good job. And boom, yeah, keeping me centered. I'm not bumping off lanes or anything. Proper lane tracing system. Now, one thing that all Americans are thinking right now is, is this a replacement for the Land Cruiser in the US? And yeah, it is. However, it's kind of, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of a dumb Land Cruiser because it doesn't have the option for a center differential. It only has the transfer case and part-time four-wheel drive, which if you're going through varied conditions or you just wanna be able to get in and drive and always have the confidence of four-wheel drive all the time, with a transfer case system, you can't really do that because when you turn, it's gonna bind the transmission. You cannot drive this every day on pavement in a four-wheel drive mode. You have to be in two-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive is only for when you're on a slippery surface. And that's not all the time. Sometimes it's varied conditions. And in that case, the Land Cruiser is superior. On the flip side, the Land Cruiser in the US is being sold as the Lexus LX600. And the LX600 is really great off-road, but it doesn't have 
the big spacious cabin that you have here in the Sequoia. So I like some things about the LX600, but I like some things about this. I like the size, I like the looks, I like all of this, except not in red, but no cool center diff. And the funny thing is that the prior Sequoia had the fancy center diff. It did. So they've actually made the four-wheel drive system, even though it's more capable because of it now has MTS and all the advanced off-road stuff, it's not as capable day to day. And I think a lot of people who drive these big SUVs, they don't really care about all the off-road stuff. They want to be able to get in a car and drive anywhere with the confidence of four-wheel drive. This vehicle does not provide that. Yet the competition, uh, the you know, the Chevy Tahoe, for example, does offer that. And so I think that's going to really limit the audience for this particular vehicle. And now we have one final test. It's a little off-road course that they put together. Now there was a proper off-road course, which we filmed some other vehicles on yesterday. Unfortunately, torrential rain overnight has destroyed the course. It's just mud and we're not running mud terrains so it would just cake up and be useless. So for this first feature, what they've done is they've compacted some moguls and they're pretty big. So we should get wheel lift. Now granted, you don't want wheel lift in the real world, but this will show you kind of what the limits of the new Sequoia are. For this, I'm gonna go into four high, eh, let's do four low so I have all the features available. Put it into neutral, wait for that transfer case to shift. Boom, now we're in four low. I have the off-road system turned on, I'm gonna go into drive and uh, away we go. So I'm gonna do this twice. The first time I'm just gonna use MTS so we can see how power shifts around. And I'm going to use, uh, let's do rock, which is the most extreme. That way we're not gonna damage the course very much. So what, what this will do is it'll use individual wheel braking to stop a wheel from spinning where torque would bleed out. And instead that is then pushed back into the system. Now, in some ways, this is a little bit better than a rear locker. However, in other ways, it's not. And you can see the difference as I do this. So I'm going over, power shifting around. MTS is doing its great job of shifting that power. Ooh, scraping a little bit. And then down we go. Now, let's see what that looks like with the locked rear differential instead because I think you'll see quite a difference in how that vehicle then climbs over the hill. So I'm going to turn off MTS this time and I'm gonna engage the rear locker. So what the rear locker will now do is it will make sure that power is locked side to side so we don't have to wait for wheel spin before it shifts that power. I'm gonna go ahead and get this all set up. Great, now as I move forward, those two rear wheels move together in tandem, which pushes me forward. So you can see that there's definitely an advantage to having a rear locker, but it doesn't work in all situations as the ideal solution, but it does in many. So the next feature we're gonna show is crawl control. It's kind of like an off-road cruise control that integrates the MTS functionality. So let's go ahead and turn off that rear locker. I'm gonna turn on crawl. And we're just gonna start with the lowest speed possible. I'm just gonna let the system do the driving essentially. I mean, I still have to steer, but I'm going to aim using the cameras in the front here. There we go. And now I'm gonna line up for that wheel trench. Just use the camera right here. Let the system do the magic. And I can, of course, put the brake on at any time that I need to. And you can see I can just actually aim right there for that hole with the wheel. And in fact, we can also see the graphic of what's under the wheel itself too. So now it's gonna to try to sort it out. This is where it really uses that brake traction system 
to move me forward and get me through it. Now that's also a really good system uh, for if you're in deep sand, it can actually dig a vehicle out of sand. I've used that in the past. And one thing about this new hybrid system is that the MTS system is very, very quiet. Uh, likewise, crawl control. In the past, it has been very loud. Uh, almost like, you know, you're feeling like you're breaking something, but now it's very sophisticated, yet highly, highly capable. Okay, and then I can just dial up the speed and we'll just roll out. Or put the throttle on if I need more gas. So that's my first look at the 2023 Toyota Sequoia TRD Pro. I do like it, but I might have trouble recommending it to a broad audience. I think it really targets a very specific buyer. And given the cost of this thing at north of 70 grand, that's really gonna limit the audience. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. We'll see you again right here.